In this session, I want to talk about ecumenism, particularly the Roman Catholic attitude and perspective on ecumenism, what it is, what the church has said about it, and how we go about the ecumenical endeavor. First definition. Ecumenism um, refers specifically to the search for unity among Christian denominations. It is a desire that grows out of the recognition that Christian division is something that shouldn't be. It recognizes that all Christians are united to Christ by virtue of their baptism in water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and, their, and by their belief in Christ as fully human and fully divine, the second person of the Holy Trinity. It aims at a full and visible unity of the various Christian communities into one church, the one household of God. Household in Greek is ekumene. That's why this is called ecumenism. Sometimes in casual speech, we talk about ecumenism as a dialogue between religions, between Christianity and Hinduism, for example, but that's not how it's used in proper theological discourse, because it refers to the Christian ecumene, the common unity of Christians. It rests on the understanding that the church is always one, and so it seeks that that unity be visible. The principles, basic principles that under, underlie the ecumenical endeavor is that the church is the body of Christ. All of the um, central aspects of the church that you find in the first chapter of Lumen Gentium is at stake here. The church is one. And its holiness derives from its unity. Christians division, Christian divisions thus, thus diminish the church. Another principle, though, is that this union is not something that can be achieved by our efforts alone. It is not achieved by negotiation and compromise. It has to be discovered by growing closer to Christ. The problem with Christian division is that it takes the gospel and interprets it in fundamentally different ways. But it's not always clear what is compatible and what is not, what is common and what is not. And so the ecumenical endeavor recognizes that the author of unity is the Holy Spirit. All steps in ecumenism are taken in prayer and an opening to the Spirit in humility. It cannot be a program with stages and deadlines, because it is the Spirit who is accomplishing this. What do we want from ecumenical dialogue? What we want is friendly acceptance of other Christian expressions as honest attempts to give expression to God's desire for humanity. We want dialogue that is based on historical research, theological reflection, and spiritual contemplation to bring out commonalities and points of real division. We want prayer together as much as our commonalities allow, without covering over real differences that prevent prayer together. So, in general, what exactly is <clears throat> ecumenical engagement? It is essentially dialogue, where members of different Christian communities come together to try to find together what they have in common and to be clear about what divides them and to take these divisions to prayer, to research, to theological reflection. In the prayer, again, that God will lead us to unity, because there can be only one following of Christ. There might be diversity, but this, this diversity should not create division. And so Catholics gather with Lutherans, Lutherans with Reformed, Baptists with Presbyterians, to meet together 
to recognize each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, and to try to allow the Holy Spirit to take root in us such that we can grow closer to Christ, and in growing closer to Christ, find the unity that seems to be lacking. Our ultimate goal is full visible unity. We want a unity that can be embraced in day-to-day -day life. Differences may remain, just as there are differences within the Catholic Church today between Latin Rite Catholics and Eastern Rite Catholics, which have very different ways of expressing Christian life, particularly in the liturgy, but also in other ways. There are differences within the Catholic Church in practices, devotions, and there are different emphases on different doctrines within the Catholic Church, all of which maintaining full and visible unity. In the same way, there may be differences that remain based on traditions of Christian life, where authentic Christian life has been discovered. The Eastern Orthodox, for example, we recognize as having an authentic tradition. And the principles of dialogue with the Orthodox rest on that, that these differences will not go away. This is also a possibility with Protestant communities, the Lutheran tradition, the Anglican tradition, may have things that are completely, and it seems do have some things that are completely compatible with the Catholic vision, and so differences may remain, but each should recognize in the other the fullness of Christian expression and be confident that everything that we do is the one church. This means that doctrines can't be contradictory. Even though we might phrase them differently, we have to recognize that they are really getting at the same Christ lived out in our particularity. And thus, practices may be different, but they should be open to everyone seeing in them the authentic Christian faith. As you can see already, this is not an easy thing. This is a rather abstract idea of our ultimate goal. The concrete way to get there, we have these concrete parameters. But we have a lot of differences that we have to bring to the table. And so the first principle is friendship. And with friendship, we can begin to tackle the more difficult items. The history is long and complex. I just want to give a, sh a brief overview of particularly the recent history here. But the ecumenical spirit is not something new. The fervor of the ecum ecumenical movement in the past 100 years, 125 years, is new. But the basic theological principles that underlie it are not. Take, for example, just to give a brief introduction to our look at the church. As the idea of the church develops in the early centuries, it is immediately apparent from the Acts of the Apostles on that Christ has established the church as the means by which humanity comes to salvation. Again, the first chapter of Lumen Gentium is a good place to look for this. The truth of human life, the fullness of human life, comes in Christ, and the only way to live the life of Christ is in the community of the church. Thus, the Cyprian of Carthage in the mid-third century was able to express this in a nice, pithy slogan, Extra Ecclesia Nula Salus. There is no salvation outside the church. This recognizes that the Spirit is bringing humanity to union in Christ through the church. Salvation is coming through the church. If you want to see what someone who is being saved looks like, he or she looks like a faithful member of the church because it includes far more than merely personal prayer and relation to Christ. 
It includes a way of living, a way of living with one another, and a way of living in relationship to God, and this is the church. However, this no salvation outside the church should be understood properly. When Cyprian articulated it, he thought that this meant that if you had a division within the church, division is impossible because the church is one, and for him this meant that those who set themselves against the authentic church set themselves outside of the church and thus outside of salvation. And in, a, in his treatise called on the unity of the church, he argues that there can be nothing in these schismatic communities, these separated communities, that has anything to do with goodness, anything to do with salvation. His contemporary, the Bishop of Rome, Stephen, Bishop of Rome, of course, is later to be called Pope, corrected this. He argued that indeed the church is one, the church cannot be divided, but human sinfulness leads to division. And these communities that see themselves in opposition to what the, ma the majority recognizes as the official church can be in some communion with the church. If a community shares in the form of the church, particularly in its beliefs and its rights, baptism especially, which was his particular concern at that time, then Christ is present there, even if the community is not united to the official church. And so Stephen held against Cyprian that baptisms performed by these rival communities, these schismatic communities, is still the baptism of Christ. Those baptized into these communities are still in some way church. They're not complete, but they're baptized into Christ and they are Christian. Stephen's position was affirmed at the time. It became part of the Christian tradition. So the idea that there can be fuller and less participation, communion in the church, originates the very early days of the church, as soon as divisions start to happen, actually. In the fourth century, reflection on grace and sin, and in the fifth century, through Augustine's debate with Pelagius, showed that God's grace is visible in the actions of persons. In other words, Augustine held, and, 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 was, and the Council of Carthage and the Council of Orange approved this by the, uh, by the tradition of the church, that in order for human beings in our current state, a state of sin, to do any good, we need grace. Therefore, if you have people doing good actions, then you see that God's grace is working. Therefore, where people are growing in goodness, there is a growing in grace. This means that where there is a growth in grace, there is the church being made, presence, made present. Because to grow in holiness is to grow in participation in the church. The church and salvation are tied together. This growth in holiness is not yet a full expression of the church, because the person may not have even come to the realization of faith yet, but it is the beginning, and indeed an invitation, to seek out that fuller expression that is coming to be in the person. These two principles of the boundaries of the church set by external expression and set by the movement of grace is the fundamental, you might say, ecclesiology, understanding of the church, of the broader Christian tradition. Now just to fast forward really quickly, because we don't want to spend all day on the history, by the time you get to the Reformation in the 1500s, um, the issue of schism and the unity, the unity of the church become right there in the forefront of European consciousness. There had been division before, particularly the division between East and West, but 
the Easterners were in the East, not in the same places as the Westerners. And so it wasn't so much a conscious, everyday concern. There are some exceptions to that, of course. But the Reformation puts this front and center. And it really shakes the understanding of what the church is. And the reformers indeed come up with different ideas about how to express the church and how to express the unity of the church. And the Catholic Church in response comes up with its own reassertion of the tradition. In the first years following the Reformation, up until 1650, many never really held the, the, the position of Cyprian that Stephen rejected that all separation is a falling away from Christ. This meant that there could be only one true church, and everybody else is simply outside of grace. Which, again, never was the traditional understanding. After 1650, where you started to have integrated societies of Protestants and Catholics, there gradually arose a recognition of the ways in which these separated communities shared in the grace of Christ. This took a long time, because in our modern conception it's very hard to deal with truth and diversity. And indeed much of our, our thinking about the value of pluralistic society is forged during this time period. It wasn't until the mid-1800s that something some further recognition began to grow. And it began to grow in the early 1800s through theological thought about the church and comes to bear in practice in the latter 1800s through the ecumenical movement. The ecumenical movement begins in Protestant circles, particularly in regard to missionary work, going out to evangelize non-Christian places, because if you're bringing the gospel of Christ and you have competing, you might say, flavors of Christianity, then the communication of Christ is obscured. If you go to one island in the South Pacific and convince the people to accept Christ and baptism as Lutherans, and then next week the Baptists come along, and argue that your Lutheran baptism is not valid, you need to be rebaptized. it just becomes a kind of marketplace, and the gospel goes away. And so, in 1888, the U.S. Episcopal Church and the Anglican Communion calls for an end to division, that we need to somehow work together. In Edinburgh, in Scotland, 1910, the World Missionary Conference brought together representatives from different Protestant communities and put forward the need to ground unity in what we have in common, the scriptures, the apostles and Nicene creeds, the sacrament of baptism and Eucharist, the history of the episcopate. This takes, up, takes on steam. In 1921, the International Missionary Council founded a, a, a thinking group, a um, think tank, you might say, called the Conference on Life and Work, that really began to work on how Christians can cooperate in social service and action, improving society, working together rather than at odds. Another kind of think tank, another community of di different Protestant theologians came together in what was called the Conference on Faith and Order. Faith and Order is concerned with doctrine and liturgical practice and ordinations and things like this, structure of the church. These discussed a theological basis for church unity. The International Missionary Conference continued to talk about a common way of evangelization. And there was founded the World Council of Christian Education to try to work together on how to educate people in Christ. All of these movements in the early 1900s, particularly post-World War I, 
were concerned with putting Christ first and allowing our divisions to take a second place. This culminated in 1927 in Lausanne, Switzerland, what was called the World Conference on Faith and Order, where all major Christian traditions, including the Orthodox, participated in this discussion of how we can come together, how we can recognize one another as united in Christ. Catholics did not participate in this. Catholics were a little bit late coming to the ecumenical table, and I'll talk about that in a minute why that was the case. All of this was spurred on by the previous declaration in 1920 of the Eastern Orthodox Patriarch of Constantinople, who wrote a, a letter addressing the churches of Christ everywhere, calling for unity, a communion, a koinonia, fellowship of churches, that division is contrary to the gospel. So this consciousness is growing and becoming quite active in the Christian idea of who we are as Christians. There is a, um, this kind of river that you can find on the World Council of Churches website that shows how these various movements come together in the combined effort for Christian unity. All of this was embodied in a literal body of people called the World Council of Churches. The World Council of Churches was founded in 1948 when the Conference on Life and Work, which dealt with social action, and Faith and Order, which dealt with theological reflection, joined together. The Missionary Council joined it in 1961, and the Council on Christian Education joined it in 1971. All of this coalesces, as you see right after the Second World War, where the divisions in, in uh, political divisions in society brings forth a more urgent need for spiritual unity. And so the World Council of Churches exists as a standing body that promotes dialogue among Christian communities. It is founded to foster unity. The Catholic Church is not a member of the World Council of Churches, but it does participate in the doctrinal discussions. Ever since 1968, there's been a Catholic member of the Conference on Faith and Order. You can find them at their website, which is there on the screen. They gather together representatives of all Christian communities every some years. There have been 10 so far, starting in 1948 in Amsterdam. The last one was in Korea in 2013. There's another one, and the next one is scheduled for Germany, Karlsruhe, Germany, in 2022. It, has, it was going to be 2021, but with the virus and everything, it's been pushed back to 2022. Their mission statement, you might say, is given there. The World Council of Churches is the broadest and most inclusive among the many organized expressions of the modern ecumenical movement, a movement whose goal is Christian unity. The WCC brings together 349 churches, denominations, and church fellowships in more than 110 countries and territories throughout the world, representing over 560 million Christians and including most of the world's Orthodox churches, scores of denominations from such historic traditions of the Protestant Reformation as Anglican, Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist, and Reformed, as well as many united and independent churches. While the bulk of the WCC's founding churches were European and North American, today most are in Africa, Asia, Caribbean, Latin America, the Middle East, and the Pacific. For its member churches, the WCC is a unique space. So what, is it, what, do they, what does it do? It's a space in which they can reflect, speak, act, worship, and work together, challenge and support each other, share and debate with each other. The member churches, they believe, are called to the goal of visible unity. They're, they call, they're called to promote a common witness in the work of mission and evangelization, to engage in Christian service, and to foster renewal in unity, worship, mission, and service. To put it concisely, 
It is a fellowship of churches which confess the Lord Jesus Christ as God and Savior, according to the Scriptures, and therefore seek to fulfill together their common calling to the glory of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the World Council of Churches is a, an organ for Christian unity. It does not in any way seek to be binding on its members. It's not a governmental organization. It seeks only to facilitate dialogue because, again, it is founded with that same recognition that we saw before that Christian unity is something that Christ achieves, not us. The World Council of Churches is an organ to ensure that we keep opening ourselves to Christ in this regard so that we are open to finding unity where it is happening and seeking unity where it seems that we can only find division. It is not saying that differences don't matter. In fact, it is saying that the differences are identity forming and thus need to be brought to Christ and brought to one another in order that any commonality may be found. Not everyone, not all Christians, not all Christian denominations belong to the World Council of Churches. Some reject the whole ecumenical project, seeing that any human work for Christian unity is, is fruitless, kind of Pelagian aspiration. Rather, seeking to follow Christ in their own way without any dialogue with one another. The Catholic Church might seem to be like that, but in fact it's not. The Catholic Church is not a member of the World Council of Churches, and I'll talk about why that's the case in a minute, but it is not of the opinion that we are just to go along our own way and let Christ work out the status of these others, because the Catholic Church like those in the World Council of Churches, realizes that our behavior is essential to being Christian. And part of that behavior is seeking unity among everyone, but particularly unity in the belief in Christ and in the worship of Christ. The Catholic involvement in ecumenism has been much slower, though, because, as with all things, the Catholic Church is always very careful in keeping to the tradition and ensuring that the steps towards dialogue do not in any way compromise the faith of the Church. Because the Catholic Church is of the conviction, as indeed many Christian communities are, certainly the Orthodox, and um, in, in many ways a lot of the Protestant communities, are convinced that we are, or they're convinced they are, the authentic expression of the Christian tradition in the present day. We all hold that we are apostolic and Catholic. We are expressing the faith of the apostles, the one faith of the church, the faith of the church that is universal. For Catholics, this means quite a bit of caution in ecumenical cooperation, lest it seem that we give up on being the example of what we believe to be the good of the Christian faith. And so its very first engagement with ecumenism in 1896 was a critical one. Leo XIII was critical of ecumenism in his encyclical of 1896, but still this is an opening of the door because he actually engages with the ecumenical movement. In 1919, Benedict XV had a meeting with the bishop of the Protestant Episcopal Church, which was a significant thing, recognizing some kind of status to a bishop from a Protestant church. Catholic engagement, as I'll talk about in a minute, begins not primarily through coordination from Rome, but through the activity of cardinals, bishops, and local people. Conversations between Anglicans and Roman Catholics were held after the First World War between 1921 and 1925 by Cardinal Desiree Joseph Mercier, of course approved by Rome, 
but it was under his direction. Pius XI assesses the ecumenical movement in 1928 and finds many things to be critical of. Ecumenical conversations begin in 1937 at the Trappist Monastery of Les Dom. And so things are on the way. In, 19, in 1898, a society was formed in Graymore, New York, of Episcopal Anglican um, communities that sought Christian unity. And they began what was called the Octave of Prayer for Christian Unity in 1908. This became the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity that is, that is celebrated by many Christians, including Catholics, every year between January 18th and January 25th. In 1909, the, the whole society, which was dedicated to the following of St. Francis, was received into the Roman Catholic Church as the Franciscan Friars of the Atonement. So they're now a Catholic order, Catholic Franciscan order, dedicated to the pursuit of Christian unity, to encouraging dialogue, and to encouraging scholarship on different Christian traditions for the sake of facilitating dialogue. Their base is still in Graymore, New York, which is at the very top of New York City, very up there. Their friary was established in Rome in 1949 at the Church of Sant'Onofrio in Rome, and they established a library and study center in Piazza Navona in Rome in 1960. They were indeed the hosts of many of the ecumenical dialogue partners during the, during the Second Vatican Council, and they continue today to be an active force in Christian dialogue. Some of the major figures on the Catholic um, side were um, uh, Paul Irne Couturier, who in 1933 also established a prayer for Christian unity. He was a pioneer in spiritual ecumenism, in other words, promoting prayer for unity and prayer that could be done together. Lambert Baudouin founded an ecumenical monastery where monks from the Eastern tradition and monks from the Western tradition lived together in the same monastery, Orthodox and Catholic, celebrating their own liturgies, but coming together in, in living and in dialogue. So East uh, Orthodox Catholic dialogue there. Augustine Bea um, was selected by um, Pope John XXIII, well, first of all, by Pius the, the, the XII, to begin dealing with dialogue on behalf of Rome, in Rome, and when a office of the Roman Curia, the Secretariat for Promoting Christian Unity, was founded in 1960, John XXIII made Bea the first president. Now, in regard to papal statements, again, we move slowly, but you can see progress right down through the 20th century. I want to focus on two statements prior to Vatican II to show you some of the differences and continuities that happened there. Pius XI in 1928 considered the burgeoning ecumenical movement and offered Catholic reflections on it. Some will see it as simply condemnation of the ecumenical movement, but that's too simplistic. He certainly was not very hopeful about it, but by providing this critique, he actually helps the Catholic Church to begin to come to see ways in which this movement is not simply wrong. And eventually, we'll come to see that this movement is of a great good for the Church. So, Mortalium Animos, Pius XI. He laments the superficial hope in the spiritual unity of humanity that overlooks real differences. In other words, what he's afraid of, and this is still the fear that keeps the Roman Catholic Church from being a member of the World Council of Churches, the fear is that we see Christian unity as a merely superficial unity, where we can just be friends. What that does is overlooks the real differences. In other words, 
that the following of Christ, the way that you follow Christ, matters. It would be too easy to fall into a kind of radical Protestant idea that faith alone matters. So long as you have faith in Christ, none of your practice matters. But that is certainly not the Catholic opinion and not the opinion of many Protestants. And that's the fear of Catholics towards the ecumenical, move, ecumenical movement in the early part of the 20th century. He says these hopes for kind of superficial unity are founded on that false opinion which considers all religious to be more or less good and praiseworthy, since they all in different ways manifest and signify that sense which is inborn in us all and by which we are led to God and the obedient acknowledgement of his rule. He warns against this false hope, the unity of Christians, the authentic unity of Christians he said is for other Christians to simply come back to the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, he says, is the perfect united society. It is the church in its structural ideal. Of course, individuals don't live up to the ideal, but the structure of the church is everything that any Christian needs for salvation. Catholics cannot, therefore, take part in assemblies with non-Catholics that are not based on the truth of the Church. What Marcalium Animos is, is stating, what... What Mortalium Animus is setting forth then is a principle of Catholic ecumenism. Well, two principles. Number one, that we believe that the Catholic Church has got all of the elements right. To be a church is to have the structural elements that we have. Secondly, second principle is that the elements matter, the structures matter. To move to unity without looking in detail at differences in practice, differences in um, beliefs, is a false unity. And Catholics, as a kind of third or, or, or sub-principle, Catholics cannot take part in assemblies with non-Catholics that don't reflect this truth. Now again, some see this as a condemnation of, of ecumenism, but Catholic engagement with ecumenism always follows these main points. In other words, we're always clear to say in any form of ecumenical dialogue that the Catholic Church cannot give up its practices because it is the repository of a tradition that we see as essential for humanity. In the same way that the Orthodox hold that of their own practices, and some of Protestant communities hold the same. So ecumenical dialogue in which Catholics take part in recognizes the specificity of what we have and the fact that it expresses our relationship to Christ, something we see as a gift to others. Secondly, Ecumenical dialogue, at least as far as Catholics go, is always concerned with real confrontation of differences. We try to find honestly what our commonalities are and express honestly our differences, which is one of the emphasis on one of the reasons we emphasize full and visible unity. We're not united until we can find practices that are compatible. And third, the ecumenical activities that Catholics engage in are always based on these principles. We don't take part in assemblies that suggest a false unity. And again, that's why we still don't join the World Council of Churches, because it could be perceived that the council itself is the end goal. A kind of unity by aggregation rather than a unity by transformation.
1943, Pius XII addressed the meaning of the church in a way that opens reflection even more towards ecumenical principles. He says that, well, he was arguing against an idea that originated in Protestant circles but began to be um, something talked about in Catholic church circles that the true body of Christ is not visible. That the body of Christ is a mystical body. That's what that Latin phrase in the title means. Mystici corporis Christi means the mystical body of Christ. It is a spiritual body that might exist within the Catholic Church, but it might exist somewhere outside of the Catholic Church in other Christian communities. And Pius XII saw, rightly, that this is, is not the truth. When Christ acts, his action is visible. Going back to that principle we saw with Augustine and the Councils on Grace, where Christ dispenses graces, change happens. And therefore, the church is visible wherever God's grace is happening. He willed, Christ willed to dispense grace through the church. And so the church is the, not only the, the instrument of grace, but the manifestation of grace. And so paragraph 14 says, They err in a matter of divine truth who imagine the church to be something invisible, intangible, merely pneumatological, or an act of the Holy Spirit. The church is visible. There is only one head of the church, which is Christ, and we as Catholics see the Pope as Christ's vic vicar. Therefore, the fullness of the church is found where you have unity with the Pope. And if you, can, if you believe, he says in, in paragraph 41, that you can accept Christ as the head of the church while not adhering loyally, loyally to his vicar on earth, you have taken away the visible head, broken the visible bonds of unity, and left the mystical body of the Redeemer so obscured and so maimed that those who are seeking the haven of eternal salvation can neither see it nor find it. This is an emphasis that the structural organization, the hierarchical organization of the church, Catholics see as essential to keeping people on the path to holiness and essential for maintaining the unity of the body. The invisible mission of the Holy Spirit bringing people to holiness and the structural or juridical commission received from Christ are the same. Grace brings about participation in the community, the, the structured and organized community of humanity, which is aligned to Christ through the office of the Bishop of Rome. And thus, true unity, it says in 69, what we would call full and visible unity, is manifest through the cooperation of all its members, through profession of the same faith, sharing in the same rites, participation in the same sacrifice, practice of the same laws. This is full and visible unity. And then this long quote, which you can read at your leisure, is towards the end of the document, saying that he is concerned about Christian division and invites all other Christians to become Catholic, essentially. The last line says, We wait for them with open and outstretched arms, to come not to a stranger's house, but to their own, their father's home. Now, you might think this is rather negative towards ecumenism. And there, is a couple, there are a couple of negative things there. First of all, this last sentence that we just saw. The unity of the church we found when all Protestants become Catholic. Or, the other statement we saw, it is essential for the composition of the church that honor be given to the Pope because without the Pope you're not in unity and these are indeed problematic principles but they're not obstacles to participation in ecumenism 
to take this last sentence first, certainly we believe, and so do all other committed Christians, believe that all Christians would be better off doing things our way. We are committed to the Catholic vision of church, and so we believe that all other forms are indeed in some way defective. Just as Lutherans believe that the Lutheran way is the fullest way, and all other forms are in some way defective. Catholic Church, because it adds too many extra things. Others, because they don't have essential things. Only those churches that hold to an, an invisible idea of the church, resting the church solely in belief in Christ, would deny that. But even they would say that their, their particular congregationalist way of church is the best way. So this is not an obstacle to ecumenism. This is merely being honest about our own commitment. The other emphasis on the Pope is, again, one of the things that Catholics bring to the ecumenical table. It is part of how we see full and visible unity. And so this has been one of the very productive aspects of dialogue with the more organized churches, particularly Orthodox and Anglicans, is to have discussions about how unity is brought about. And if you reject the Pope, why do you reject the Pope? And don't you have some way of maintaining unity otherwise? And so rather than being an obstacle to ecumenism, this encyclical, like Pius XI, provide a context and tools by which we can truly engage in dialogue. Because what Mr. Chikoporis gives us is the basic principle of Catholic ecumenism that we saw already in Stephen and Stephen and Cyprian's debate in the third century. The church is visible. Where you see the life of Christ happening, you have the church. Therefore, it is impossible to deny that Protestant communities are participating in the church. There may be deficiencies, and from the Catholic position there certainly are deficiencies, but there certainly is the Spirit of Christ active, bringing people to holiness. And so there is some communion in the church happening there. That's, all of that idea is affirmed here in this report. <clears throat> and so when we move to the Second Vatican Council, which is just in the next pontificate after Pius XII, the pontificate of, of John the Twenty Third, it starts in the Constitution on the Church, Lumen Gentium, as we've seen in other contexts, affirms this fact that the Church is in the process of history, bringing all people to salvation. It is bringing all humanity into unity that the fullness of the church is present, subsists, is manifest within the Catholic Church. This fullest presence is in the visible organization headed by the successor of Peter, the Pope. But as it says, if you remember in paragraph 8, many elements of sanctification are found outside its visible confines. So just as we saw in the beginning of the 3rd century, just as we saw with um, the implications of Mr. Corporis of Pius XII, we see, visibly see, elements of sanctification in other communities that are not in communion with the Catholic Church. The organization of the Church begins with the people of God and is structured in regard to bishops and the Pope. And in paragraphs 15 through 15 and 16, the church is linked to all the baptized. When people are baptized, you have a relationship to the church. Even those who have not yet received the gospel, which we'll talk about in regard to interreligious dialogue, wherever there is good happening, there is the church happening. And so the, 
not just prayer for unity, but the work for unity is part of the mission of the church and an imperative thing for all Catholics, that they should be in the process of sharing their faith with other Christians and in friendly and honest dialogue, recognizing our common Christian identity and working to see one another more and more as the face of Christ. So it says, Mother Church never ceases to pray, hope, and work that this unity may be achieved, and she exhorts her children to purification and renewal so that the sign of Christ may shine more brightly over the face of the church. When the council, the, the document on the church was approved in 1964, the council also approved a short document on ecumenism itself. As you have read, if you haven't read it, you should read it before we go through it together because it gives a concise vision of the Catholic understanding of ecumenism. The Latin title is Unitatis Redintegratio. It says, going over some of the principles we've seen already, the division of, among Christians hinders the preaching of the gospel. The council gladly takes notice of the ecumenical movement. So the shift in attitude is quite dramatic between Pius XII and, um, and Paul, the, Paul VI, who was Pope at this time, but really of the council. The ecumenical movement may have problems, but it's, an, it's a good thing for the church. Third, the admission of the sinful and historical circumstances responsible for the current state of divided Christendom is certainly there, but often enough, it says, men of both sides were to blame. And so in paragraph three, it says that the Protestant Reformation, and indeed the break with the Orthodox back in the beginning of the, of the second millennium, it wasn't just them breaking away from us. It was a division that occurred through the participation of both sides. And the sin on both sides led to the division. And further, it makes a distinction between those who set up something apart from the Roman church, Luther, for example, and those who now live in these communities. One cannot, it says, charge with the sin of separation, schism, those who at present are born into these communities and in them are brought up in the faith of Christ. And the Catholic Church accepts them with respect and, aff and affection as brothers. And so what it's doing here is turning, this, turning things on the other way. Rather than be looking at the problems with ecumenical dialogue, it looks at the positive elements. It's not saying something different than Pius XI and Pius XII, but it's looking at it in the more positive light to see, indeed, we do see other Christians as brothers. They're not enemies. They're not servants of the devil. Those properly baptized who believe in Christ are in some communion with the Catholic Church. There are many differences in doctrine and discipline, so we're not in full communion. But it remains true, it says, that all who have been justified in faith and baptism are incorporated into Christ. Therefore, they have the right to be called Christians and to be accepted as brothers and sisters, we would add, by children of the Catholic Church. <clears throat> Thus, these visible elements that Lumen Gentium affirms that exist outside of the Church belong to the Church itself and lead people to communion. And the very practices of Protestants, this is separated communities, Orthodox and, 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 and Protestants, can lead its members to salvation. Baptism, Eucharist, in other communities is not perfect, is not complete, but it can indeed be the occasion for grace. For it says the Spirit of God has not refrained from using these separated churches and communities as means of salvation, which derive their effect efficacy from the very fullness of grace and truth entrusted to the Catholic Church. Of course, the fullness the document affirms, along with Pius XI, Pius XII, and the whole tradition before, 
The fullness is found in the Catholic Church. In the Catholic Church, there are all of the means of salvation. Not the most saintly people, but structurally the fullness. And so we're always going to judge other Christians on how they measure up to us. But again, as a footnote, this is simply being honest. This is the way that most Christians enter into ecumenical dialogue. <clears throat> Even though we'd say we have the fullness, the need for ecumenism is to seek out what we have in common. All the Catholic faithful are urged to take an active and intelligent part in the work of ecumenism. There's no opposition between ecumenism and bringing others into the Catholic Church. They're distinct. We're always willing and glad to welcome others into the Catholic Church, no matter what other background that might, they might have, other Christian background, because we see that they're entering into a fuller expression of Christian life. But this can go hand in hand with dialogue with those who do not see the Catholic Church as a fuller expression. Thus, the Catholic's primary duty is to make careful and honest appraisal of whatever needs to be renewed and done in the Catholic household in order that we may bear witness more clearly and faithfully. So, one of the fundamental emphases we have here is that we're not perfect. Indeed, we recognize all of the elements of salvation within us, but we're not, we recognize, always the best example of this. And so one of the principles of the ecumenical movement for Catholics is to live more authentically our life as Catholics. And this involves being a good neighbor to our other Christian brothers and sisters, gladly acknowledging and esteeming the truly Christians and de Christian endowments of their common heritage which they share. As far as the practice of ecumenism goes, Unitatis Reis Integratio says from Vatican II that ecumenism is an obligation for all Christians, certainly for all Catholics, because it concerns ourselves with, number one, presenting ourselves, living the church in its fullest fullness, so as to show our vision of church to other Christians, but also to work to heal divisions. So ecumenism begins at home, you might say. It begins with the renewal of our own church, which then presumes an inner conversion, the renewal of all those engaged in the Christian life. This inner conversion, along with praying, actively praying for the unity of all Christians, is called spiritual ecumenism. As much as possible, we want to pray together, but there are hindrances to praying together. It has to be a genuine expression of what we have in common. Remember the caution from Pius XI, we can't engage in practices together that don't reflect the truth of our relationship. Therefore, when we gather together to pray, the Latin terminology for this is communion in sacris, communion in sacris, sharing in sacred things, we should witness the unity of the church already achieved and thus share in the means of grace that we mutually recognize. Which means, for example, that we cannot share the Eucharist with others because we are not agreed upon the nature of the Eucharist. Which means we cannot celebrate Mass together with other ministers celebrating at the altar with Catholic priests. But we have a lot in common beyond that. We can read scripture together. We can pray based on scripture together. We can pray the Psalms together. And above all, we can pray together for Christian unity. There's two contradictory principles at work. On the one hand, to pray together suggests a unity that's not achieved, but it also contributes to unity. So we don't worship together all the time because we're not in full agreement. But we worship together some of the time because it promotes the grace of union and promotes the grace of recognizing one another. So we try every so often to gather with other Christians in prayer and specifically prayer for Christian unity. This time set aside for this by the church is the week of prayer for Christian unity from January 18th to the 25th. But 
can happen at any time in the year. The bishop has the authority to determine when and how in his diocese this should be done and promoted. As far as living the Christian faith, Catholics should know our own faith and how we differ from other Christians, which means honestly coming to know what the doctrinal differences are. This comes about through discussion by competent people, both within the Catholic tradition and under other traditions, to clarify where the differences truly exist. And thus theology should be taught with regard for, it says the ecumenical point of view, which means regard for being honest about our commonality and our difference. Above all, and this was one of the principles of the Second Vatican Council as a whole, the manner and order of the expression of Catholic belief should not become an obstacle to dialogue. This doesn't mean that we should compromise in how we express our belief, but that we express it clearly and completely, which clarifies which truths are more central to Catholic belief and which are more um, accompaniments to the essential beliefs. This is called a hierarchy of truths. And so we should explain things in their fullness and resist a polemic attitude. In other words, an attitude of condemnation. Because nobody listens when you're trying to condemn the other. Cooperation together for goods and society, like feeding the hungry, is beneficial, the document says. So we've got a different tone to the relationship between Catholics and other Christians coming out of the Second Vatican Council. And this continues on down through the magisteriums of Paul VI, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and Francis. The principles remain the same. We see the Catholic Church as the fullest expression of truth, but the whole modus of operating is one of seeking communion rather than standing in opposition. So just to do a little bit of comparison before we conclude, there's a continuity and discontinuity between the early 20th century and the late 20th century. The continuity is the principles. Unity of Christians is based on the unity of the one church. Humanism has to be based on Catholic principles. And there must be a clear distinction of the levels of truth. Developments, however, are the recognition of a unity with Christians, an explicit recognition. You could say it's implicit in the earlier writings, but it's certainly not explicit. The confidence is there and the basis for a real dialogue, an emphasis on visible unity already present, and indeed finding possibilities of being able to gather with other Christians in ways that recognize this truth. It's not the gathering with other Christians that's the problem, it's the way in which it's done. The emphasis on the visible church, we still take from Mystici Corporis, and the stress that the hierarchical and the spiritual church are not two separate realities. What we do recognize with the Second Vatican Council is that the identity between the Catholic Church and the spiritual communion of Christians is not identical, but it's one complex reality. The Church of Christ is not the Catholic Church simply, but the Church of Christ is manifest, subsists in the Roman Catholic Church. Some aspects of the Church exist outside its confines and give sanctification and truth. And so we say things in a far more positive way. We say today, nevertheless, many elements of sanctification and truth are found outside its visible confines. Since these are gifts belonging to the Church of Christ, they are forces impelling towards Catholic unity. Whereas in the 40s, 1940s, Pius XII said they have taken away their visible head, broken the bonds of unity, etc. Focusing on the problem rather than on what we have in common. These developments are based on trying to be more authentic to the tradition. 
holding to the principles and seeing the real commonality that the grace of Christ is already establishing. Reflection on the thought of Augustine, further reflection on the relationship with the church, the truth, and continually emphasizing the centrality of the church for salvation. Indeed, Lumen Gentium makes explicit what no salvation outside of the church means. If you know that the Catholic Church is necessary, then you should join it. Other Christians are actually already joined in many ways to the Catholic Church. They don't have the fullness of Catholic faith, but they express they possess many aspects of the Church. Scripture, faith in Christ, baptism, some other sacraments, perhaps. And thus, we can share in prayer, so long as this prayer honestly reflects our commonality. No salvation outside the church is still a principle of Catholic ecclesiology, but we are far more careful now of drawing a clear line between inside and outside. The affirmation of degrees of participation in the church is essential in recognizing where God's grace is working beyond the visible boundaries of the Catholic Church, but still within the communion of the Church that flows out with God's grace. So we can say that the Catholic Church manifests, subsists, is the subsistence of the Church of Christ. Other Christian communities, we simply call them ecclesial communities, church communities, Churches, the word churches, as we'll see in the follow-up to this presentation, are, is really a name we reserve to the Orthodox communities, where we recognize the fullness of the Episcopate and the sacraments. We're aiming towards full and visible communion, and we're trying to define, among our diversity, what keeps us apart, what is communion dividing, and what is simply a different way of doing the same thing. So, to sum up, there's three ways you can look at ecumenical progress. One, as a progress of recognition, a common search for truth, where we try to see in one another the fullness of Christ. Second, is simply a gradual acceptance of diversity, recognizing that diversity is an essential aspect of human existence. And the third is to see ecumenical progress as a program to be achieved by setting goals and compromising where necessary. These are incompatible visions. This last one is sometimes how ecumenism is perceived by its critics, but it is not a perspective of anyone involved in ecumenical dialogue. No one sees ecumenism as an active program that we have to achieve. This is the vision of the Catholic Church, common search for truth. Some see it as an acceptance of diversity, but we see that second principle as what Pius XI condemns as a superficial unity. So to put this more graphically, this would be the unity based on the recognition of diversity. We don't change, we stay just as we are, we just learn how to accept the equality of all people. You recognize this, and then you all grow together in your own specific ways. This kind of attitude we would see as overlooking and not taking seriously the real differences that continue to separate us. Differences that will not be healed until they are brought to the full light of dialogue, prayer, and reason. So we're meant to be one church, visibly one church, but how do we do that? The old way that the Catholic Church, the language of the Catholic Church suggested, we saw that in Mortalium Animus and in Mystici Corporis, is that the visible unity will be found when all of these errant folks come home. Come back to the Catholic Church and you'll find your unity here. We've got all you need. This is not, not even really 
the sense of the Catholic tradition, even though it certainly is the language and the attitude of many in the early 20th century. A better way to talk about visible unity is this way. I know the image is not perfect, but I, what, it mean, what it's trying to show is that we are always in progress. We believe that everything the Catholic Church has is essential for the full visible unity of all Christians, but we recognize that we live it imperfectly. And so even the structural things that we have are often not fully lived out. And so we are moving to a fuller and fuller expression of what we have, but learning in a real way from our dialogue, ecumenical dialogue, how these things can be brought to the fore and what kind of balance that can happen. And so the Roman Catholic Church is becoming even more Roman Catholic, you might say. And in dialogue with other Christians, we are hoping that they are becoming more and more authentically themselves and thus leaving behind those things that keep us in division. Because if the Lutheran, for example, if the Lutheran tradition is an authentic Christian tradition, then it should not be incompatible, the Catholic one. So our hope and prayer is that as Lutherans come closer to Christ, they come to resemble us more and more, until one day we can recognize the full and visible unity that incorporates the legitimate diversity of all different Christian expressions. This, as I see it, is the Roman Catholic vision of ecumenical unity. And these are the principles of ecumenical dialogue.